Hi, I'm Stephen Shu, and this is another episode in the Cognitive Challenges of Effective Teaching, a video series created by Bill Serbin and myself. In this episode, we're going to talk about the constraints of mental effort and working memory. So let's start by taking an example of how you might see this in the classroom. So let's say you're teaching a complicated concept to students. In order to help them to learn, you create a learning activity, like a lab activity, for them to complete in order to help them to master and understand uh, the concept. Okay, so you might think, well, now that the students have completed the lab activity, they understand the concept. When in fact, a number of your students may be struggling because of the constraints of mental effort and working memory. So for example, one student may say, I had to concentrate so hard to complete the lab that I um, have no idea what I was supposed to gain from it. So they were using their full concentration just simply to complete the lab. And they had no mental effort or concentration available to think about what they were supposed to learn from the lab. A second student may be having trouble uh, with the capacity limits of working memory. That student is thinking, there are so many details, remember, that I got completely lost. So there were too many details for that student to keep in working memory, uh, and therefore they got overwhelmed and they didn't really um, take anything away from the lab activity. Okay, so these are examples of the constraints of mental effort and working memory. So let's take a closer look at what's happening uh, with these constraints in the memory system. So here's a simplified version of a human memory system. Uh, and we start on the left with the learning materials, which are uh, in the environment, and the student has to take in the information through their senses, primarily hearing and uh, vision, and all that information uh, goes into sensory memory. Now from here, attention will select some of that information from sensory memory for further processing. Attention does, uh, has two functions, both of which are really critical uh, for learning. The first function is selection. It selects what information is relevant and it filters everything else uh, out. That's the selective nature of attention and it is a challenge uh, um, on its own and it's the subject of a, of a separate video. What we're concerned with here is the second function of attention, which is mental effort or concentration. Okay, you always have a limited amount of mental effort or concentration available to you. In other words, it's always a limited resource. Okay, you only have a, a certain amount of concentration you can devote uh, to any given task. Now, let's say that uh, attention has successfully selected the right information and you're able to concentrate on it. And it makes it to working memory. Working memory is our conscious short-term memory. It's the memory used whenever you're consciously thinking about things, right? It's the only memory with a capacity limitation. Right. The capacity limitation of working memory is, a, is roughly four chunks of information, although the exact capacity limit is going to vary depending on the amount of information uh, that you're trying to keep in mind. But there will always be a limited capacity, some limit on the amount of information you can keep in working memory. If you try to hold more than that capacity limit, you're going to start forgetting. So we have two different kinds of constraints here. One is a process constraint which is concentration or mental effort. The other is a capacity constraint, which is the amount of information that you can hold in working memory. And both of them can uh, affect our ability to get information into long-term memory, which is our permanent storehouse of memory, which is the goal of, of teaching and learning. So it's good to have a sense of what it's like to use um, concentration or mental effort uh, and uh, working memory capacity and what it feels like uh, when you uh, come close to hitting those constraints. So let's do a little activity to kind of uh, demonstrate this to ourselves. In the first example, what I'm going to ask you to do is to solve four simple math problems, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. I'm going to show you the four problems and you can pause the video so you can solve them uh, mentally without writing anything down. So here are the problems. Okay, were you able to solve those four problems? Uh, solving those four problems took both concentration, you had to like focus your attention uh, and use your mental resources to uh, solve them successfully, and it involved working memory. You had to uh, recall your rules for addition and subtraction and, and uh, multiplication and division factors in order to solve that. You had to keep track of when you had to borrow, when you had to carry, uh, things along those those lines. So it uses both um, uh, mental effort and working memory capacity. Now let's do a second example uh, to show what it's like 
uh, when both mental effort and working memory become taxed. Okay, in this example, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to memorize a six uh, digit sequence so you can recall it in order after a 30 second delay. I'm gonna show you a series of six digits. You'll have six seconds to memorize it so that uh, you can keep it in mind uh, for 30 seconds and then recall it in correct uh, order, okay? So I'm gonna ask you to do something else during those 30 seconds, but right now just focus on memorizing uh, these six digits. Here we go. Okay, keeping those six digits in mind, I want you to also solve these four math problems mentally. Okay, 15 seconds has passed. Five seconds remaining. And stop. Okay, so what was the number sequence? Do you remember it? Okay, here's the number sequence in case you remembered it. Now, I was asking you to do two different tasks this time, both of which tax both mental effort and working memory. So maybe you had a lot more trouble uh, doing the math problems than you had the first time, or maybe you started forgetting what the sequence was. So this is what it's like to have uh, to reach the limit of, of capacity or of uh, the capacity of mental effort or the capacity of working memory. It's not pleasant. Uh, and it's something to keep in mind uh, when you're working with students, uh, when they're concentrating and they feel overwhelmed, it's not a pleasant experience. Okay. Um, so they may uh, uh, sort of want to be disengaged from the, from the class for that reason. Same thing with uh, when uh, the capacity of working memory is taxed. All right. So um, I've been using examples from math and uh, from uh, STEM type courses, but the same thing happens in humanities courses. So for example, when a student uh, reads a Shakespeare play for the first time, like, like Hamlet. So um, imagine this example where a teacher is, is going over Hamlet and asks students uh, to interpret a quote uh, from, from Hamlet, a speech that, that um, uh, Hamlet makes to Horatio. Now, obviously, the answer that uh, she's looking for has to do with interpreting the, the uh, underlying meaning of what Hamlet says, okay? But there are students who are gonna be struggling because of uh, mental effort and because of working memory capacity. So they're trying to keep in mind uh, all the different characters, for example, Horatio is a friend. They have to keep track of like, uh, is Hamlet's mother Gertrude or Ophelia? Um, they have trouble with the language because the vocabulary is, is unfamiliar to them and the grammar is is also unfamiliar to them. Uh, they're wondering if they're supposed to be interpreting this literally or, or figuratively. Um, and it's unpleasant for them uh, ha having their both their mental effort and their working memory capacity taxed like this. And they just think to themselves, well, I can just Google the answer. It's easier and I can get rid of all of this unpleasant mental uh, effort and, and working memory uh, load. Uh, and they may think that it's confusing and boring and why should they care about it, right? And so they'll uh, distract themselves in another way. So you have the same kind of problem with working memory uh, and mental effort capacity, uh, mental effort uh, constraints uh, in all fields. All right, so let's talk about uh, what each, uh, uh, each of these constraints uh, in more detail and how we deal with them. We'll start with mental effort. In order to understand mental effort, you have to understand cognitive load theory, which was developed by uh, Sweller and Associates. So they start with the idea that mental effort or concentration is always limited resource, which we've talked about. And then uh, they talk about cognitive load, which is the total amount of mental effort a task requires to complete it. Some tasks have fairly low uh, uh, cognitive load, like memorizing a new vocabulary term. Others uh, have a very uh, high cognitive load. Uh, like reading a Shakespearean play for the first time. So you can uh, distribute your mental effort or concentration across multiple tasks, as long as the total cognitive load of all those tasks doesn't exceed your available mental effort. If uh, the cognitive load does exceed mental effort, then your performance is going to suffer. Your performance is going to uh, really fall apart. Uh, in that case, you're gonna be overwhelmed, okay? Now, uh, let me show you how this might work 
uh, using uh, examples from, let's say, a statistics class. So here's a, uh, a probability problem. It's very straightforward. A standard deck of cards, what's a probability of randomly selecting either a red card or a 10? And it's a pretty straightforward question to ask as long as you know what a standard deck of cards uh, consists of. Now, I can cast the same problem in terms of a pinochle deck. Uh, if you're not familiar with the pinochle deck, this is going to have a huge cognitive load because you have to understand it's a 48 card deck, although there are variations. The deck consists of 12 cards and four suits, uh, two of each of uh, you know certain cards. The rank of the cards is different. Uh, and uh, so uh, in a pinochle deck, then what's the probability of randomly selecting or either a red card or a 10? Right. It's the exact same problem as before, but the cognitive load is much greater. And a student may actually uh, get this wrong, not because they can't understand the, the probability concept, but because the cognitive load uh, is simply interfering with their ability to, to recognize the problem. They have to concentrate on the problem. They have to discriminate between what is really relevant to the problem and what's not relevant. Uh, and they may miss it, uh, not because they can't understand probability, but because of the cognitive load. All right. Now, it's important to keep in mind uh, that uh, students often are under a, a huge cognitive load. Uh, if they are engaged in a class and taking notes, then they have a large cognitive load. This is a uh, diagram of the cognitive load of various tasks. And here is note taking from a lecture, which is slightly more effortful than two experts playing a game of chess. When students are taking notes, they are engaged in the, the presentation. They're trying to discriminate between what is critical to know and what is, is secondary. And they are free writing a narrative, which will allow them to remember this later. So students actually uh, have uh, are operating under a heavy cognitive load, and it's easy to overload them uh, and overwhelm them. So how do we deal with cognitive load? Uh, the first thing is to be aware of what's called the curse of expertise. Okay, uh, faculty have spent years studying uh, their subject matter, and they forget what it's like to be a new learner, to learn the information for the first time. So they're poor judges of how quickly the information can be learned and how much support students need in learning it. They tend to think that students can learn it more quickly than they really can, and students uh, need less support than the students really, really do. So the first thing is to realize that we often are very poor judges of how much uh, support and how much time students need uh, need to learn. Okay, so oftentimes students need more help and more time than we really think. Okay, the second uh, way we deal with cognitive load uh, is through deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is when you intentionally practice a skill with the goal of, of learning or improving on that skill. The more you practice uh, a concept, uh, recalling it and applying it, the, the, the less the cognitive load, it becomes more automatic uses less mental effort to do. So students need a lot of, of uh, deliberate practice. Uh, so give them a lot of deliberate practice and using information and you'll reduce the cognitive load. Okay, now we turn now to the limited capacity and working memory. As I said, it's about four chunks of information. A chunk is a psychological unit of memory. It's composed of organized coherent information and you can store about four of those chunks. So for example, Let's say you're going to the store and you need to remember uh, your grocery list uh, and you're trying to memorize the separate items, lettuce, tomato, carrots, and dressing. Those are four items that would pretty much fill up your working memory. But if you can organize those informations into a coherent whole, like salad makings, I need to get salad makings, then you've taken those four chunks and you've organized them into a single chunk, coherent information that acts as a single unit in working memory. OK, so that tells you uh, how to try and deal with the capacity limitation of working memory. OK, to present information as a coherent framework of chunks to help students to create bigger chunks of information, because you, you can get an unlimited amount of information in a chunk, you, but you only have four chunks at, uh, you know, in short term memory. So the idea is to build big chunks of information. So instead of presenting information as like a list of separate uh, facts, OK, um, you present it as a framework uh, that's related to each other. You emphasize the, re the relatedness of all the different concepts, uh, helping students to create uh, big chunks. Okay, So this is a concept map or an advanced organizer, and it really helps students to see the, 
the framework of, of uh, relationships among the, uh, the facts, and it helps them to build bigger and more meaningful chunks of information. All right. So if you want to learn more about uh, 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 mental effort and uh, uh, also working memory capacity, you can take a look on Bill's website, Taking Learning Seriously. He has a whole section on these constraints. Uh, here are a couple of, of uh, resources that you can read about cognitive load uh, as it relates to teaching. And then finally, here is a resource on understanding working memory for uh, use in the classroom. Now, we'll end with discussion questions. So here are questions you can discuss with your uh, colleagues and talk about how uh, working memory uh, capacity limitations and capacity lim and the limitation of, of mental effort uh, show up in your classroom and how you can address them. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you on the next video.